<laughs> just to get a little bit of feel. How many of you watch the show week? Just one person. <laughs> Our House of Commons. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Congress is very little like House of Cards, more like me, just a little, a little more chaotic. As I figured today, we'll I'll talk a little bit about you know my experience as the Chief of Staff, as well as working with the Council and Senate. Um, a little bit about how things work up there structurally, and then also what's not working today. And then briefly a little bit about what you all can do more to influence Congress. And then from there, a little bit about life as a candidate. And then just hopefully we'll do Q&A and then we can get into some policy questions as well there. So first, uh, just a quick overview. The structure of the Congressional Office, how decision making is done, and how we all can influence Congress, and then my own way of trying to influence today. So I was a chief of staff for two and a half years in Congress. As Professor mentioned, uh, I was chief of staff for 30, so I was one of the youngest in US history. And a lot of the role of a chief of staff is a couple things. You're working almost in a sense like the executive of the team, the, the member of Congress ends up being the brand and the product. And then you're the person that makes sure your budgets are in order, you have a staff to do whatever you want to do as an office. And you're kind of making sure all the trains move on time and while at the same time providing some of the political advice and guidance and things that kind of have to come up when you have big policy issues. So just go into a, a little bit of how the structures work. So every office, whether it's the House or Senate, functionally has this. You have a, dis a DC office and a district office. In the DC office, you have a chief of staff. Uh, you have a legislative director. That's the person that manages the policy team. And largely when bills come up, they're the first ones to kind of take a look at it and then make sure staff gets to see it. And then you have legislative assistants. Depending on the size of an office, you can have several. So when I was working in the Senate, I was working for a US senator, and I was handling two committees for him. And I was one of several assistants, but I was a lawyer by training, so I was a legislative counsel. And we had, I believe, five. The Senate offices are bigger. And on the House side, you end up having like two to three. Uh, and then you have legislative correspondence. Those folks are also helping on policy. But they also help make sure that letters are answered and just constituent requests that come into Washington, D.C. are getting the responsiveness they need. And then you have the scheduler. Uh, largely, that person plays a role of helping make sure that the member of Congress is where they need to be and people are getting the access they need in the office and kind of the whole gamut of things that might come up. And then you have staff assistant. That's oftentimes the person you see when you pick up the phone and call Congress, that's the person you're talking to, or if you go to congressional office, it's the person at the front desk. And that person's kind of like the utility infielder of sorts. They do everything. And then on the district office, you have a district director, which functionally serves very similar to the legislative director. It's kind of that filtering person, but also that chief representative of the member of Congress when he or she's not in the community. And then you have field representatives. Depending on the size of an office, you can have a cup two to a five, just depends on how an office prioritizes that. With Senate offices, those teams are a lot bigger. And you have caseworkers, and this is probably the most important role in a congressional office for the community, because people go to their members of Congress usually. I used to tell my staff this, that you don't go to your congressional office and just come in and say, hey, you guys are doing a great job. That just never happens. You should go in if you have a question or a concern, whether it's on a policy issue, or you might have an immigration question, or you might be trying to get a federal housing loan or you just want to figure out how a program works on health care, uh, or social security if you're a senior citizen. So case workers tend to handle that. And then you have staff systems that, again, the utility infielder just helping on everything. And then the big portion that both offices really rely on are interns and fellows, because you're talking about districts that are, on the congressional side, roughly 750,000 people. And we're talking maybe 20 to 25 people on a congressional staff. When you're in the Senate office, you're talking about a state like California with millions of people. And, and probably, I would say, Senator Harris or Feinstein, probably under 100 staff, and they have different offices throughout the state. And so that's a lot of inflow of people. On the DC side, it ends up being very policy centric on what are we voting on? Where does the member need to show up? How are we going to address a policy issue? On the district office side, it's more community-facing. Uh, you know, should we have a presence at this event? 
what are some of the concerns that the community had when they want to come in and advocate, and then also the casework one kind of being the most important. The biggest flows of casework a congressional office gets are from the Social Security Administration, people want to make sure they're getting their benefits, or veterans who are returning home and want to make sure they're getting their veterans' benefits, uh, and immigration cases. Because a lot of times you do play a role in helping people you know, get through the process. And I would say not enough attention goes into this when we're talking about politics, because this is how you make democracy really representative and you make sure people are actually getting what they need and they feel that their tax dollars are doing something. Uh, I remember when I was working in the Senate, we had several families that we ended up helping avoid deportation. Uh, I, we had, I had one colleague, and she would tell me several different stories where she had a family where the mother was on the way to the airport to be deported. And she had such good relationships with immigration and customs enforcement, and they knew the family was on the right side in terms of the paperwork and everything, that she was able to get them to turn the van around and bring the person back home. And, and you, you end up having, you end up meeting a lot of veterans, the same thing, where you know, they're struggling for months just to get a response from the Veterans Administration. And like we had one guy, and sometimes it's just basic stuff where you know, people want to be with dignity and stuff. This guy, you know, he had served in Iraq, he had his leg injured, and he just wanted a TV in his room at the VA hospital so he could watch the doctor game. And so it was one of those things, you want to make sure you know, people have sacrificed for our country. And, you know, so you have the staff kind of put the call in. Um, and that's kind of a small example, but more broadly on the veteran side, oftentimes when I would come back in the district, I would personally just keep the staff and meet with some of these agencies because we have a veterans backlog, or we have a veterans backlog throughout Southern California, where it sometimes can take one to five years to get your claim processed, which is a big deal. You know, it's a healthcare issue. And so a lot of times you bring the DC staff to come in and meet with those folks and you know kind of put a little pressure and ask, you know, what's going on. And then on the on the DC side of things, this is the flow of, you know, if you how many of you been to Washington, DC? And so when you've gone, you've probably done a tour of the Capitol or you know, just or took a meeting in the office. You're most likely interviewing with in, interfacing with a staff assistant or maybe legislative correspondent. Most constituents, unfortunately, just deal with I write a letter, this is the person that's responding to the letter, or I called and this is the person that's answering the phone call. The staff assistant answered the phone call, legislative correspondent to the letter. Not enough conversations are with the legislative assistants, and those are the people who were kind of really doing the hard work of getting the input in for the member of Congress on whether to vote yes, whether to vote no, or what policies to propose. And then obviously legislative director too, you want to make sure that this person's visible and present in the community because that person's getting the influx of the information. So that's a structure. Quickly responsibilities, I kind of started to go into it. DC office, this is the, I guess this would be the ideal, of having kind of sat up there we can go over best and worst. Uh, I'd actually do a slide on that. So DC office, number one, you want to be the voice of the community in Congress. It's a representative democracy. So you want to make sure when you look and see, is that representative serving our community? Because members of Congress work for the community. And so, you know, if the community has a high rate of folks uninsured, you want to make sure the member of Congress is trying to represent those folks make sure they get insurance. Or if you have you know, a lot of seniors with higher out-of-pocket costs, you want to make sure that member of Congress is representing to make sure those costs are addressed. So DC office, the voice of the community, they're reviewing legislation on behalf of the community. And often in terms of how that goes, just to give you an example, you're, uh, you're either drafting legislation, and it often comes from someone in the community says, hey, I've got a great idea how to fix this problem. They, I got a great idea how to make, make health care affordable for small businesses, and this is an idea. And maybe they're a part of a trade association or another organization that can kind of come in and advocate. Or it's just individual constituents saying that, or it's the staffer who's doing that research to figure out, okay, I'm hearing a lot about this problem. You know, our small businesses are having a hard time complying with some of the different health care requirements, and it's getting really expensive. Let me look into it and see how I can fix it. And then that's where they're reviewing legislation, seeing what else is out there, and sometimes just drafting it themselves. Then you're advocating for federal resources. This ends up being a big portion when you're, for, generally for members of Congress, because again, you're trying to be the voice of the community. You want to make sure the community is getting its money. 
As Californians, we don't get our fair share in Congress. We never have. We pay more into taxes than we get back. And that ends up making it all the more important to have a member of Congress making sure if there's a big highway transportation bill, let's make sure it's going to the 57 or the 91. You know, if there's funding going for child literacy, let's make sure that that's coming into Walnut or Fullerton. You know, you, you want to you want to advocate that, and sometimes that's letters, sometimes that's meeting with agencies. That's on the member level and the staff level. And then that kind of ties in these three are kind of all together. You're pursuing policies that, per, that improve the lives of families and workers. This is the ideal. This does not always happen. Uh, and then I think in our today's political environment, this is not happening enough. And lastly, you're receiving visitors from the community in D.C. So whether it's uh, hospital workers coming in for their annual lobbying day or students coming in for a tour of the Capitol, uh, you know, you're the representative. You're the, the office is owned by the community, and so you know you're kind of hosting people and bringing them in, and ideally answering their questions. So that's the DC side. The district office, kind of similar. You're representing the member in the community. So, and I can say this as a candidate now. We'll get that a little later. You can't be everywhere at the same time. That's just physically impossible. And in a district like this, it's 14 different cities. So. You're talking about the different demands of time, so often the staff has to come in and represent the member and be very knowledgeable on you know, what the member wants to do or what they care about. You're assisting constituents with federal agencies. This is the number one goal of district office. And you're connecting constituents with federal resources. This should be the number two goal. This does not happen enough in Congress. Uh, when I was a chief of staff, we held 40 health care workshops in the San Fernando Valley on how to sign up for the Affordable Care Act. And so we had throughout the community at different community centers and libraries, we would have staff to sit there in the library with covered California to sign people up for health care. We had a thousand families come through the door and ultimately sign up for health care. <coughs> we found out at a forum for district directors, we were the only office in Congress doing that. And what often happens, and this is the criticism of both parties, is you pass a law, you spike the football because you passed it, and then you just go back in the locker room and you forget the actual hard work is making sure people are taking advantage of that law. Uh, I would say, I think with teachers, I think I was reading the other day, was the summer you were the other day, 40% uh, of teachers take advantage of the loan repayment assistance program, which basically if you have student debt and you're a teacher, you know, there's repayment programs to help lower your costs after the fact. Pretty much no one takes advantage of that program, and largely is because no one tells them that it exists. So what program? It's loan repayment system. You know, it's, it's, you know, the people in public service, whether you know, you're a first responder, you're a teacher, you're a nurse, there's a lot of programs to help people get into public interest, but no one really knows about it. And that goes into that. When I was at the Commerce Department, we had all kinds of programs for businesses on how to export, you know, how to get government contracts, and how to do these different things. And what I saw was some offices would have a whole host of those, making sure people knew and take advantage of it. Most offices didn't. And so it kind of goes in the back thing. We're all paying for these offices to exist. We're all paying for these programs to exist. Number one role is to be a voice, but also represent. And part of that comes into making sure all those federal resources out there come back into the community and people know about it. I think it's one of the biggest tragedies of our system that we focus so much on is the bill going to pass, or did he vote yes, or, or did he or she vote yes or no? And not enough on, okay, yeah, that's one part of it, but like, let's make sure it's actually implemented well. Let's make sure it actually is getting into the community and the, and the money's getting into the neighborhood. And then, you know, the other aspect of the district office, and this also does not happen enough, explain what's going on in Washington. This is where you got to answer people's questions because there's a lot of questions out there. I highly doubt that after Trump's executive order today that you'll hear many members of Congress going in the community and explaining what does that actually mean. And so what that leaves is the rest of us to figure out what does that actually mean, when a lot of times these offices do have a lot of information. And so there should be a back and forth on what's going on. We have technology to do that. I mean, I was working at Tesla, and when you look at Elon Musk's Twitter, a lot of times it will be Tesla owners tweeting out at Elon Musk, saying, you know, the car's not working on this, or we're having a glitch, I need a repair, and he'll respond back. And a lot of times he'll incorporate those. So if the CEO of a 40,000 person company, that's a global billion dollar company, has the bandwidth, a lot of times obviously it's not him, but has the bandwidth to go back and forth and get the questions and concerns for people, 
think Congress can do that too. Uh, but that just doesn't happen enough. Um, maybe that changes because you know the current president does like Twitter, and that might help with. But we have a lot of different. We have a lot of different avenues to have a back and forth dialogue. Uh, that this just doesn't happen, and that's where you create some of the anxiety that we're seeing today. And then the last portion, which I think is again one of the most important, that literally never happens. You have convening power to bring the community together. So. A good example of that, again, most people look at Congress and like, well, that's the person to go in there and vote on things. That's not the full scope of the job. Maybe that's 10% of the job. The rest of it's making sure people are getting their benefits, making sure that the people you're having, people are understanding what's going on in government, but also convening to solve problems. And, you know, when I was working in the Senate, I was working for a Colorado senator, and there was a big uh, meth problem in the state of Colorado where a lot of young people the thing with meth is if you try it once, it becomes almost like a permanent, so addictive that it becomes like a, almost like a permanent condition. You lose your teeth, and there's a lot of just physical downsides. Don't do drugs. Yeah, don't do drugs. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying don't do drugs. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we, so Senator Salazar at the time was seeing that problem, and he was trying to figure out what are some solutions outside the box to deal with this. Because it's not just telling people don't do it. You have to find different creative ways to do it. And when he saw in Montana, there was a Montana Met project where they had a lot of videos that were very hard hitting and educational. On it was almost it was called like a not just not even once campaign. Uh, and so what he did was he convened all the different foundations in the state, all the different rich folks, all the different influencers, brought them together, talked about the problem that he saw as Attorney General at the time, and well, previously as Attorney General of the state of Colorado, but also as a senator. And said, you know, we have different avenues of federal resources to help support this, but like this is a good program going on. Let's figure out how to get this to our state. And the reason you can do that is because he had that pin. When you do have that pin, you can convene people. We obviously have a big problem here in Orange County with homelessness. It's that crisis point. I mean, I grew up here, never seen anything like this. What's going on by Angel Stadium is just a travesty. There are a lot of different federal resources foundation resources, private sector resources that we could be using to bring people together to actually solve these problems. But no one's really doing that convening power because most people, when they think of Congress, they're thinking, you just vote. And, and so uh, there's certain expectations of if Congress is working at its best, it's using, it's doing all of these things on the district level, and when it's considering policy, it's considering all of these things. And I think that's where some of the shortfalls kind of come in. So what does a member of Congress do? I think that's a fair question people ask these days. And as a chief of staff, I kind of got a window on what that day looks like. This is a very shortened version of that. Um, but you know, number one role is obviously to represent the community and be a voice for the community. This can involve voting on legislation, overseeing federal agencies, whether it's making sure the Veterans Administration is getting those benefits to our veterans, or if you're on a committee, making sure that the, that agency that you have oversight over is using its money wisely. Um, or it's convenient people to solve problems. I think those are the main three things that you can do as a member of Congress. For the most part, people just do number one. Uh, number two, just to give you a quick example, this never gets discussed in the media. Most federal agencies have not been reauthorized for decades. And what I mean by that is there's laws that establish like the Department of Commerce. And then those laws expire, and you have to pass a bill to reauthorize them. Normally what we do is we budget money for them, and then we don't actually go in and reauthorize. So you have programs that will stay in place for decades, even if they don't really necessarily exist, or need to exist. And you have things that we can be more efficient at that we just don't focus on. So I think it, when I was in the Senate, I counted, there are 22 agencies that do the same sort of intelligence gathering work as each other. And it's because each time something happens, it's like, well, let's solve that problem and pass a bill. And so they go in and they add another program in. And that's not necessarily required when you can actually just look at the law, update it, and make sure the offices that are in place are actually doing their job. And, and so the oversight aspect, it just doesn't happen. And it's kind of a problem on both parties. When a Democrat's president, the Democrats, if they're running Congress, tend to not like to do oversight of their own party, vice versa with the Republicans. And so what you end up having is a situation where we don't have enough people looking into making sure the machine of government's working well. And then that's how you get the situation where you have more casework that needs to happen because 
people are having to call Social Security to ask, like, where's my check? Or the Veterans Administration. And, you know, if, you're, if Congress is doing its oversight job and really focusing in on that, because their goal is to be representative, and so they need to represent the community, all of you who are the investors in Congress, and making sure that your dollars are being spent well. And then lastly, members usually serve on several committees and carry obligations of members of their party. So serving on committees usually are on anywhere between one to three committees. The committees do the oversight. They're where legislation goes through. They do hearings if there's an issue. So uh, with the wildfires, there likely will be a hearing in the Natural Resources Committee to kind of talk about best practices for emergency response at some point, or there should be at least. And so, you know, and they'll get to review. And sometimes it's just taking testimony in and listening to people and figuring, okay, what didn't we get right or what we did get right to create a public record. Uh, and then the member obligations as member of their party, this sometimes is obviously the voting aspect, this is the part of electing leadership, this is also the part that's a little more political, which I'll get into, of members of Congress have to spend a lot of time raising money, uh, both for their own campaign and for their party, uh, which is unfortunate then because if you, there's only 24 hours in a day, and so much time can be taken on the floor of the House or in a committee or meeting with constituents, and then you also got to put in a certain amount of time to fundraise. You can only do so much, it can only be so many places. So how decisions are made in Congress, there's the ideal, and then there's the reality. First we'll go into the ideal, um, and this ideal, in some ways, every office, to their credit, does some aspect of this. It's just a matter of the reality is fewer and fewer of this is going on. So, member of Congress is engaged with a back and forth of their constituents on their opinions on key issues. This is the Tesla Musk example on Twitter. Like, wouldn't it be great if we were having a back and forth right now on, so how many, I'm assuming most of you are on your parents' health insurance or any of you buying it on your own or through your job? You're buying it on your own? It's like, in an ideal world, you'd be having a back and forth with your member of Congress on like, hey, like, this past month was kind of expensive. You know, what's going on? And then they can kind of, you know, more broadly look at the scope of like, what's going on. Um, but you don't have it enough of that. Sometimes you'll have it with the staff, which is just the same as the member, because they, there is a back and forth. And then, you know, ideally you're consulting with experts on both sides of the issue to develop the best policy. So, uh, you know, when you're looking at, uh, on, on the healthcare side, when you're looking at uh, regulations on like what drugs can be approved to enter the market, um, which the Federal Drug Administration uh, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, Food and Drug Administration, does the regulations on what prescription drugs are out there. In a perfect world, you're a member of Congress, and you're having some issues in the community about that, and you'll bring in the companies, you'll bring in some professors and academics, and you'll bring in some advocates from the community to, you know, kind of look at the issue, like the opioid crisis that people hear about a lot, about people getting addicted to uh, mostly painkillers. That, ideally, you're bringing in everyone, and you're having a conversation, and then you're coming out and say, okay, well, I've heard it all, and like, here's what I think is the best policy, and then you go to your call and colleagues and try to do that. And so that's, that's the ideal. You're listening to everyone on an issue. And then, you know, in the normal setting, you draft a bill, it goes to the committee process, each member of the committee takes time to review their vote, and, you know, decides with their staff whether this makes sense for the district, and maybe even goes into the community and kind of gets their feedback. And then lastly, once a bill passes, you're working with your staff to both localize and explain the issue and making sure people understand what was just passed, but also make sure people can actually take advantage of it. So that's the ideal. I don't think there's a good old days of it, but that's like that's the ideal. The reality, you know, while we were saying there's a back and forth of constituents, the reality is only a, man, a small handful of constituents engage on policy. So it's only the loudest voices. How many of you have ever called your member of Congress's office? Just this morning. Just this morning. <laughs> um, so how many of you have Perkins loans? Are you, you know, aware of those, what's one of the loan programs, or student loan programs for making your parents take it on? I had it as a college student. That program expired three weeks ago. There's been zero media coverage of Perkins loans. So, and the reason why is because you know, none of you all are calling your member of Congress and saying, hey, wait a second, make sure these student program, loan programs, how many of you have health grants? So that's not expired, so you're okay. But, <laughs> but, but, but there are scenarios where Congress will try to cut the Pell Grant program. And so if only the loudest voices 
are calling, and that's a good thing. We need loud voices, especially here. <laughs> uh, but if only a handful of voices, then you're the member of Congress, you're trying to think, well, what does my community think about? And if you're never hearing about issues like making sure Pell Grants are there or Perkins loans, then it just doesn't become a priority. And then you just sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, just don't focus on it. And so, you know, so that's kind of, this is the biggest dilemma we have, is just not enough people engaged. And then the second one that we have are, you know, we have folks that are representing some of the most well-funded interests, always up there on a day-to-day -day basis, always checking in on the members, and that's their job. And you can't begrudge someone of like, you work for company X, you're coming in and company X has these concerns to be able to, you know, make money and respond to their shareholders, as so you're representing their interests. That's fine, because you're a seat at the table and the expert's there. Or that's a seat at the table. The problem is when that person becomes the only expert. So on the drug, Food and Drug Administration issue, if the only people that are meeting with members of Congress are the representatives from the drug companies, and you don't have the other experts in the room, you're not getting both sides. You're only getting one side. And if that's what's driving politics, that means no one's looking out for you guys. No one's looking out for your parents. because. And so that's fundamentally kind of goes back into only a small handful. What makes it worse is so much of politics focuses on campaigning. And a lot of that means, you know, lobbyists raise money, whether through their individual or their company. Money is a part of the political process. That's not personally, I believe in public financing, but in general, it's, it's a part of the process. But if they're the only ones that members have access to on the official side, so I would, you know, as chief of staff, I'd have like someone come in at one o'clock not to pick on the drug company, it's an easy example. Have someone from Pfizer come in at one o'clock, and they're talking about X, Y, and Z things they're concerned about with some regulation or new law. And then later in the evening, my boss and I would go to a reception that the party was hosting or we're hosting, and that same lobbyist is there because you know they paid to get in. And then we're having the same conversation twice. And so again, that's not actually blaming the other person; they're representing their interests. But the problem is. If you're not doing any of the local outreach, you're not doing any of this back and forth, then you're getting the same thing said twice, and you know the reality is that just becomes what you base facts on, and that becomes that's the voice I'm hearing. So then, lastly, reality committee process does not exist in Congress. Functionally, it does not exist. The health care bills very rarely have been going through the committee process, and the reason why is because they don't want to have amendments. So when you have amendments, you have people start to tweak things and change things which goes against what the president or leadership would want to do. That's been broken for a while, and that also creates a problem of you don't have people um, getting more feedback in and improvements. And then last thing, no one's explaining policy to their constituents, and that's why we're in this era of a lot of anxiety and frustration. So why is Congress currently broken? Uh, quickly run through this, because there's a lot of analysis on that, but. From what I saw at my vantage point, most people in Washington, D.C. are focused on what K Street, which is where all the lobbyists and businesses are, think, and not enough what their community thinks. And that's partly a product of there's just not an expectation that these members are kind of coming in here and talking, and there's just that social pressure. You know, just think about, like, on campus. Like, you're going to be most concerned with the people that are in your class, and not necessarily the people in the hallway down there, unless you go down the hallway and talk to them. The other thing, and this is, I blame, of cable news, as well as Politico, and a lot of the different publications to cover it. We talk about politics like sport. It's the blue team versus the red team. Who's up and who's down. We don't talk about it in terms of policy. So today, if you watch CNN, just watch CNN for an hour, or 20 minutes if you can bear it, uh, they'll talk about what does Trump's executive order mean for the politics around healthcare. I can guarantee you that will be several of the commentators talking about that. And none of them will take the time to explain what the heck is executive order. And so, and most people then will just get that anything else. And then, you know, another aspect, campaigns have gotten more expensive, which leaves little time for constituents. And then what these end up leading to is voter apathy and lack of engagement. So fewer people are voting, fewer people are participating, and that leaves just a smaller and smaller portion of people making the decisions and influencing members of Congress. And then another portion, and this is really where it gets down to where it's broken. We're on the cusp of robot cars, cars driving themselves. If you go to CVS, you have automatic checkout clerks. Most of you have probably some sort of Apple device, and those have a lot of artificial intelligence in them, and that's only going to increase. The economy's changing. 
average age of a member of Congress is 57 years old. 20% uh, of members of Congress are from racial ethnic minorities, though well, that's roughly 40% of the population. The majority of Congress is a net worth of over $1 million. That doesn't work when you're talking about a representative democracy. So most members of Congress don't even know what a student loan is in terms of their own personal experience. Most of them have, no, have never had to work a minimum wage job. And so you just don't know what that experience is like. And so when they're thinking about these things, you can let the federal per Perkins loan expire if yourself or your kids have never had to deal with it. It's very easy because it's just not your reality. Or you can be okay with people losing their health care or not telling people about the health care they can get because you never lost your health care. And so that's just an aspect of that representation. When it comes to technology, everyone in this room knows more about technology than anyone in Congress. That's just a fact. That's also a problem because they're the ones in charge of policing, making sure our information is secure, making sure our data is okay. And so you just don't have enough representation in terms of who's involved. And then that, that partly, these two things kind of go hand in hand. Because people aren't voting and they're not engaged, you get representation that's not fitting the communities. But because representation not fitting the communities, people don't feel like they want to engage because they're like, ah, oh, it's not for me. So, how do you influence that broken aspect, and how do you make sure you get from the leave the reality to the ideal? You vote. Uh, you volunteer on campaigns. Volunteering on campaigns is important because whether you're Republican or Democrat, the elected official, the candidate, will see that there's young people involved. They'll see people from the community involved, and that does affect how you start to think of things. You, you remember who's in front of you. It's just human nature. The other things: pay attention and comment on policy. You know, write a letter to your member of Congress. Uh, Publish an op-ed. Post on Twitter and Facebook and tag the congressman. Everyone's paranoid of social media in a sense. And so if you start tagging your congressman because you think they're doing a bad job, eventually they're going to start to think, oh my gosh, a lot of people think I'm doing a bad job. And at minimum, figure out a way to respond. Not enough of this goes on because it's like, I call it the power of the Google search. If I was on social media or writing op-eds and trashing one of you, and then your Google search was just terrible, you eventually get pretty pissed off. It's just like someone Googled my name and then it's like, oh, okay. Like, I need to respond to that. And I think we have, we have the tools to actually do that to create some pressure. The other thing is show up to community events and ask questions. It's a lot harder to look someone in the eye and tell them you're going to take care of their health care. It's a lot harder to look someone in the eye and, and tell them that you're going to not support their loan programs. It's a lot harder to tell someone that you don't support them getting a better wage. And then the last one, Run for office. There's not enough young people in office. Average age is 57. Whether it's Congress, whether it's local government, we just don't have enough young people. If there are more young people engaged, that naturally influences Congress, even if it's on the city council level, because they're going to see, okay, this generation's stepping up. Best practices for instance in Congress, show up in the district and show up in D.C. If you can find a reason to go to D.C. and go to your congressional member's office, it makes a difference. Uh, Make, make the job uncomfortable, that's the social media aspect. Also, offer alternative solutions. If every idea is coming out of Washington, they're not gonna be good ideas. Because Washington, when I was working in the Senate during the recession, every week there was a new restaurant, a nice restaurant being opened, while at the same time most families in the community were being foreclosed. And that creates a disconnect if your reality as a staff person is you go to a new bar or a new restaurant while your friends and family are dealing with a whole host of issues. And so a lot of it is making sure that we have solutions based on reality. And then another thing is just the Google effect. Again, organize your friends. And everyone in this classroom today hopped on Twitter and tweeted at Royce and said, uh, well, Congressman Ed Royce, and tweeted him and asked, like, what does he think about Donald Trump's executive order today on health care and I'm worried my parents are losing their health care? There will start to be some sort of response from Ed Royce because we have, what, 30-some-odd people in the class today? If 30 people are doing that, the implication for the person on the other side of that, whether it's him or the staffer, is that could be hundreds of people being upset about the situation because it's like for every one call it usually represents several dozen people in terms of how members of offices view these things. And then, you know, vote and get people to commit to vote. Because if you're not voting, you're not a part of the conversation. So I'll just go quickly on my end, let's do some questions. On my end, my decision on this was I think Congress is broken. I think we're very far from the ideal of Congress. I think the younger generation is not represented. I'm 35 years old, so I'm on the younger side as a congressional candidate. I say, well, I'm going to run for Congress. I grew up in the community. We need representation that fits the community. And we need to make sure that 
you know, new voices are being heard, and a lot of issues are just not being forgotten. Another program that expired again this September that doesn't get enough conversation is the Children's Health, Children's Health Insurance Program. SJ. Yeah. It's, uh, I worked on that when I was a civil rights attorney and uh, during the reauthorization under President Obama. While I didn't benefit from the program as a child, I grew up with a crooked left foot. And so through most of my youth, I had to go almost monthly to the doctor's office to straighten out my foot. Uh, and I, you know, my parents, my dad worked at Jack in the Box, so they I'm comfortable working class household. Healthcare, you know, those costs have an effect. And so when you look at that, you have to have health insurance for kids because you can bankrupt families. And for Congress to just decide, we're just not going to reauthorize this until we get to it. That means today there are parents out there trying to figure out, how am I going to help my kid who might have a crooked foot? Or how am I going to help my kid who has asthma? And you know, if we're not having people engaged, people who benefit from the program or support of the program, then they're just hearing what Washington wants them to hear, the who's up and who's down question, or what business policy needs to be focused on, and not enough about the children's programs. And so you, know, you have a situation, like I look at that, and I look at the Perkins loan situation, where I'm a beneficiary of Perkins loans, that you don't have enough voices in there who are actually beneficiaries of this program or connected to these programs. And so when you have that, that's how you get a situation where there's a disconnect. When I was in law school, I looked up the update numbers. The cost of law school tuition from the mid-90s to 2004 when I graduated, 2007, I graduated college in 2004, in 2007 went up 200%. There is not a cost in the American system that goes up 200% a decade. I used to take classes at Fullerton College. It was, I believe, $35 to take a credit over there. My sister went to Cal State Fullerton. I think it was like over like four or $5,000 for the entire year's tuition. Obviously, I know tuition's gone up. Like, the cost of education has increased at incredible levels, and no one's talking about that because, again, most members of Congress are so removed from that experience of you know, trying to pay for classes and trying to get a job. And so for me, when I looked at the situation with the current president, when I saw the disconnect as a chief of staff, I actually thought I had left politics and decided to kind of jump back in. And, uh, and it's largely because we need more voices representing to make sure our democracy works better. I think in life as a candidate, I think it's the crazy aspect of you're running around meeting with constituents all the time. You're learning about issues on a local level as well as on a national level. Donald Trump every day has new announcements on different things. 99% of them I disagree with. I'd say probably 100% actually. And you know, every day you're kind of reacting to something. And so there's just that aspect. But then you also got to raise money because you got to be able to pay for the campaigns and be able to get your message out. And so as a candidate, you're kind of hustling and going around and you have to talk to as many people as possible. But it ends up being worth it because if it's an organizing opportunity to get more people involved, then you're going to get a more representative system. So I guess with that, maybe do some questions. Okay. That's good. So this is awesome. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you for the talk.